all the time. And all the time. Amen. Amen. So let us pray. Okay. Our most high and heavenly father, we thank you this morning for the privilege and the opportunity to once again come before you. Again, you have gathered us and your faithfulness endures forever. Father, we are ready to hear your word, my God. I pray that you speak your oracles to your people this morning. I overturn every demonic agenda on this platform in the matchless name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will speak to your people that as your word comes, burdens will be lifted and 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 um every agenda will be destroyed every agenda Mm. of the enemy will be destroyed as the word comes that yokes will be broken as your word comes that that uh hope will be restored in your people as your word comes that miracles will follow your word today and we will hear testimonies after today that truly you have had an encounter with your people. Father, we give you all the praise and all the honor. Come and take your place. Let me be decreased that you will increase this morning, that your people will feel your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mighty warrior, great in battle, Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior, great in battle, Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Oh, my Victoria, of the God that you serve, knowing the mighty and the power of the God that you serve, the mighty warrior that Mm -hmm. you serve. So that is the theme for this morning. And it just ties into our worship very, very beautifully. And so our text is from Daniel 3, verse 16 to 30. Daniel chapter 3 verse number 16 to 30. If somebody can can please read that for us. It's a pre- pretty lengthy one, but we need to hear that. Ma- Daniel 3, 16 to 30. Can somebody volunteer to read that for us? Please? Amen. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 to 30. I'm reading the um, NLT version of the Bible. 
verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Verse 20, then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied fell into the rolling flames. Verse 24, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in an amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and threw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, mm -hmm. walking around the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Hallelujah. Then... Amen. The high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was thing, and their clothing was not scorched. Mm -hmm. They didn't even smell of smoke. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defiled the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, therefore I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they will be thrown limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rumble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. That is the testament to the enormity, the mighty warrior who is great in battle, the God that we serve. That is the power of the God that we serve. And so looking at this passage, we realize that you know, we are in perilous times. We are in so many uncertainties that at this point, it has been a struggle for the past. In fact, for the most part of this year, we have seen so many, so much, and so many uncertainties. Now, our lives as we know it has changed. We are not sure how things will turn out. 
between all the COVID situations and everything that has happened, we are looking forward to a vaccine that we don't even know how safe it is. We are not sure when things will be back to normal as we knew it to be before COVID. There are so many questions and, and unanswered factors surrounding our situation that we all find ourselves in, especially right here in the US of A. Elections is coming up. There's so much that we've heard about what could be when we have the president talking about stand back and stand by. What does that mean? Inciting hate. My husband was at the grocery store the last time and he heard two people talking about what they are going to do during the elections, that they are getting their guns ready and mm -hmm. their bullets ready and they are not going to take anything from anybody. And all he did was stare at them like, what in the world? All we are having is an election. It's not a war. So what is going on? There's so much hate in our system now, frustrations, um, temptations, things that we cannot fathom what is going on in this life that we are in. Kind of like what happened in the time of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they found themselves in a perilous time when you will be killed if you do not bow to a golden image that the king has built. And I'm very sure that, you know, at the time people, there were some Jewish people at the time that decided, hey, you know, I'm not gonna fight this with a king. I'm just gonna bow. I don't wanna leave my children. I'm, I don't wanna leave my family. I don't wanna die in that hot furnace. So I'm just going to bow and just move on. I'm not going to be the one to be caught not bowing. So I'm sure a majority of them, for the most part, they all bowed because they were at the point where they were asking themselves, just like we are asking now, is God even going to be able to deliver us from this chaos that we all find ourselves in? That is where they were. Because honestly, the king meant business. That if you do not bow, you will be killed. And so we, they found themselves in that situation. And Daniel gives an account in the text that our elder just read for us in the chapter three of Daniel 16 to 30. And so he gives an account of what happened. Now, let's keep in mind who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. These were ministers to the king. They served in the palace. They served in the courts of the king. The king had so much respect and trust in them because of their wisdom. Daniel had just interpreted a really tricky dream that the king had had. And so those Jewish men in the palace were so valuable to this king. So this is not just another Jewish man in captivity that we were gonna throw in the furnace. These were close associates to the king because they were serving in the palace. So for them to not bow, to that golden image was a total defiance in the eyes of the king. And I'm sure he struggled to make that decision to put them in the furnace. Because first of all, they have been promoted because not everybody gets to be in a palace to minister to the king. So they were already promoted to be in the palace, to be in the presence of the king at all times because he trusted them. These were men he trusted because keep in mind, kings and queens and, and heads of states and presidents, they bring close to them their trusted people that they know that will serve and minister to them 
with the best of their ability. So these were men that really served the king. But at that time, they just had to step back and bring into remembrance the commandments of their God, hallelujah. They had to bring into remembrance the commandments of God and say, wait a minute. God has commanded us not to serve any other God but him. That is the commandment of the God that we serve. So what are we going to do with this golden graven image before us? Because the minute we bow, we have defied the commandments of God. And so they had to make a swift decision. Whose side, who is on the Lord's side this morning? Who is on the Lord's side to stand in the gap and be able to claim that integrity that we need when it comes to serving God? Who is on the Lord's side? Are we going to go by the word of God or are we going to go by what we see around us or what we are made to do? So they decided with all confidence that even in the face of death, we are going to maintain our integrity when it comes to serving God. That we are not going to tr trade our integrity for anything whatsoever, regardless. And when you listen to the boldness with which they talked to the king, that was astounding. That was astounding because now you're standing before the most powerful person of the land. And you have the boldness to tell the king in verse 16, they say that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Can you imagine saying this to Trump? Can you imagine that? <laughs> that you do not need to defend yourself before me? I'm the king, I'm the ruler of this province, this world that you're in. You find yourself in Babylon and you're telling me that you do not need, like with guts and wits, I don't have to defend myself before you. And then they go further. They tell him, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will. What confidence. Do we have that kind of confidence to stand for the name of God when we face the impossible? Do we have that? That is what I'm yearning for this morning. I don't know about you but I need this message so bad. And I'm yearning for that boldness, that confidence, that guts, that trust that you know that you know that you know that regardless of the outcome, that God will be there for you. That is what I'm yearning for. And I don't know about you. Hopefully you are too. But they go on to say, and even if he doesn't deliver us, wow. In this day and age when people are running to prophets for miracles and whatnots and, you know, all the craziness that that would be another sermon. That they are confident to say, even if he doesn't deliver us we are okay. 
We know him. We know what he's able to do. And we will still not bow to your graven image. Hallelujah. Now, what prevents us from, from being bold and standing our ground and defending what we believe? What prevents us from doing that? What grips us? I think the fundamental factor is fear. Fear is a paralyzing emotion. When fear comes over you, 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 you forget even the simplest of your morals. You forget about what you believe in. You forget. When fear grips you in any situation, you totally give up what you believe in. It can keep us from doing our job. It can keep us from, I mean, if I'm going to do this and maybe they're not going to appreciate it, I, I don't think they will appreciate it. Why do you think so? Why do you think they're not gonna appreciate what you're doing? And so you're just gonna do the minimum. Like the story of the talent that Jesus told when they were given different amounts of talents and the one servant decided to bury his talent because he thought the, the master was, was cruel. And in case anything doesn't go well, he will probably have to pay with his life or imprisoned. And so he wouldn't take that risk at all. That was fear. Fear from doing his job because of what could happen. And so fear has the capability to be suspicious of others. You are afraid of what the person could be doing. So then suspicion sets in and then it doesn't open you up for relationship or even for your dreams. So when, when you, you, you get the grip of, or you get into the grip of fear, you become suspicious at all times and all your thoughts are negative because you are afraid of what could happen. You know, these days, the young ones feel like, you know, you really have to live with a partner before you marry them. And that why is that? Because that way you know them. You know what you're getting into. So what, what if they are not the right person and you end up marrying them and it's a mistake? So people feel like, the young ones now feel like you have to know them and by the only way you will know them is to live with them. Why is that? Because they are afraid that what if they make the wrong choice? So fear will let you defy the commandments of God that you are supposed to keep yourself as a temple of God. And until you are married, that you need to do things in the right order, that you don't have to live with a partner for years before you marry them. And that it's okay to trust somebody because you know what? You will ne we will never know the full personality of our partners ever. Because life is an evolving, it, it, we are evolving every time. We, it's in phases. So at every age, there's something about your partner that you will learn that you didn't know like a few years ago. And it peels, it's, it, it keeps peeling layers after layers. There will be some good parts and there will be some not so good parts that you will find out. 
But if you're committed to the relationship, then you're willing to work it so that you all work it together and make it work for both of you. But if you're not committed, then the first time you see something you don't like, well, they can't manage money. They are liars. They don't tell the truth. And they always have an excuse for not doing something. The first day you realize that you pack up and leave. Why? Because you are afraid and you are not committed. So you're not ready to work on the relationship. So fear would grip you from pursuing a relationship. It would also grip you from your dreams. Now I'm likening the fear that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego faced to what we face because we don't have a golden image before us to bow, but we have a life to live that is a challenge on a daily basis. So if you fear enough and you will bow to the fear, then you are, you're done. The devil has gotten you where he wants you to be. So you are so afraid that you can't pursue your dreams because you started out to be an engineer and you flunked one or two classes and you felt like, you know, I don't think this is for me and I don't think I can make this and so I'm done. Why? What happened to you trying? What happened to you committing to what you set out to do? What happened to trying until you get it? Because you're afraid. And so you give up. Fear has a power to do so many things in our lives that we forget that there's power in the God that we serve and he's able to deliver us from everything we face. In the Bible, we see a lot of phrases about fear not, do not be afraid. All in the whole Bible, you will see it over and over and over again. God assuring his people, do not be afraid. God said to Hagar um, in the desert of Beersheba in Genesis 21, she said, be not, do not be afraid to Moses when he was leading his people to conquer the land uh, in Numbers 21, do not be afraid, God said, and to Joshua and to Gideon and to Elijah, to the people of Israel over and over and over again, do not be afraid, do not fear. It runs through the whole of the Bible. And why is that? Is God trying to give his assurance to his people that look, trust me on this one. I am with you. Do not be afraid. And so when you look at Isaiah 41, verse 10, again, he reassures, do not be afraid for I am with you. And he says that um, in verse 10, it says, so do not fear for I am with you, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hallelujah. And so God kept reminding us of the fact that, because he knows what fear can do. And fortunately for these three Jewish men, they remembered they brought this word into remembrance that God has always reiterated the fact that we, they should not be afraid. And so they held on to that word. So this morning, do not be afraid of that job interview that you're about to have or that response to the interview that you're waiting for. Do not be afraid. For he said he is with you. Do not be afraid for your children. For God says he loves them more than you do. So no matter what they face, that he will be with you. 
Hallelujah. So this morning, do not be afraid of the fact that there is death for us to, to, to actually look forward to because Christ is saying, I am the resurrection. And so the reason for us to, so we can calm ourselves down and rest in the God that we serve to know that he got us, he got us. And we should concentrate on him and pour out our hearts to him. Because no matter what we face, that he has promised that he will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And that is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego displayed that day. That they knew, that they knew, that they knew that the God that they serve will deliver and he will, and he can, and even if he doesn't, they knew who they served, hallelujah. So do not be afraid to be alone. Do not be afraid to be alone. Maybe you find yourself in a situation, in a relationship, in a place where you feel alone, but God said he will not leave you or forsake you. You are not alone. You feel like you're alone, but there are people around you. There's family around you, but you feel alone. This morning, God is saying, you are not alone. He is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. You are not alone. Do not be afraid of what others think about you. Because God says to him, you're special. You are the best of the best in the eyes of God. So he's saying to you, do not be afraid. So do not be afraid no matter what. And Romans 8.31 sums it up so, so marvelously. Romans 8.31, it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? What more? is there to fear. So this morning, given the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are we going to maintain our integrity in serving God? Are we going to defend our faith no matter what? The three Jewish men demonstrated that God is able to save them. And even if he chooses not to, they will still honor and trust him by not bowing to any other God, to any other graven image, to anything but God. You know, sometimes in our desperation, we turn to believe people. We turn to put our trust in people instead of God. We turn to trust the, the prophets that will give us a vision and tell us that this is gonna work instead of us going before the King of Kings and, and, and pray and seek his face. We tend to believe people. We'll rather pick up the phone and call our friends and tell them all the mess that we are going through instead of actually going to our first stop. And that is God. You face all these challenges at work in your workplace and with your peers, with your bosses. And instead of us going to God, we comfortably gossip around the corner, talking about what the boss has done and everything and how he hates us and whatever it is that we go through. But the moment we turn around, they go and tell what you have talked to them about. And the funny thing about believing in people is that they have their own mess that they are dealing with, they just haven't told you. So it's okay to have somebody you can pray with, but to just flat out go to people when you have problems is not the answer for us because they, they have major messes. And I know people, we, you know, we have the tendency of running, you won't believe what has happened. And we just run it over and over for the people to have sympathy and give us the answers, but they don't have the answers. Because if they did, they would have solved their own problems. Hallelujah. 
And so in Jeremiah 17, 5, it says, this, this is what the Lord says. It says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego realize that they cannot trust the king. Because you know what? It's only a matter of time. They will bow today, and tomorrow he will bring another decree. And here we go. And so it would be on and on and on. And before they know it, they would have lost their God, following something else. So they decided to nip it in the bud. They just said, look, we are not going to start anything that we cannot finish. We will not buy, bow today, yesterday, or tomorrow. We are not bowing, period. And that is how we need to kind of draw the line. We have to draw the line as a people of God to make that declaration that no matter what, no matter how hard, sometimes we have to take some tough decisions because of the word, because God is a God with boundaries. He gives us boundaries, not just because we are a people of God, then anything, anyhow, we just roll with it. We have to be able to draw the line and make that declaration that, you know, I serve God and I know what he's able to do. And if he's able to deliver Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego from that horrible event, then what is mine compared to theirs? We got to be able to hold on to that trust and be able to do what God expects us to do. I read a story and a very inspiring story about Tyler Perry, the movie producer. And apparently he came from a very abusive home. His, his dad was abusive and his mom flat out told her, him that this dream that you have about making movies and plays is not gonna work. Just give it up and get a real job and move on. The mom, and he said, you know, my mom loved me to death, but he told, she told me point, point blank that what, that is just a fleeting dream that you just need to give it up, get a real job and move on. It's not gonna work. So, but he said one thing that his mom gave him is God. He said his mom gave him God. And even when he was young, when anything happens, she would tell him, son, just go to God. Tell him how you feel and he will help you figure it out. So he said, that's how he grew up, knowing that there's a God that I have to run to when I'm in turmoil, when I'm frustrated, when I'm not sure that there is a God. So that is my go-to. So he moved from Louisiana to Atlanta and started pursuing his dream only to fail for the next seven years. He would put together a play that he would expect about 1,200 people and about 30 people will show up. And out of the 30 people, he knew about 25 of them. So, you know, it wasn't even like promising. And he would quit his job because the boss is not willing to give him a two week a vacation to go and do a play because the boss will be like, hey, you just started the job. What are you talking? You haven't even earned vacation yet. What are you talking about two weeks to do a play? You're fired. And he would lose a job after a job after a job. He did this for seven years with no end in sight. So he got totally bankrupt to where he had to sleep in his car because he couldn't pay the rent and pay the bills and all that. And lo and behold, 
after the seventh year, everything began to come together. Because he said in the course of all these years, he didn't feel like God wanted him to give up. And he made a, a statement that really caught my attention. He said, God wasn't speaking to me yet. So I didn't feel like I have to give up. So I kept pursuing my dream. And he said, after the seventh year, my first play in this auditorium was a totally sold out play. <laughs> and the rest, the rest is history. And right now he has built and continues to build the Tyler Perry Studios of movie production, the size of Universal. Universal is a conglomerate. So if one man can build studios to the size of Universal, then you know that the God that we serve is an awesome God. And no one who has relied on him and trusted in him and hoped in him has ever been disappointed. It's up to us. And so at that point, it, it, it was so moving to me because, you know, I could relate that, you know, he didn't just show up with millions of dollars. He had to work his way through faith, through trust, through, and it's amazing to know that people like that know God. And so his words were that, you know, don't give up on the God that you serve and don't give up on any dream of any kind that you have, because you know what? You will go through the hoops. You will go through the kinks. You will go through the struggles. But when it's all said and done, if we stay true, if we stay trusting, if we hold on to our faith, he will deliver. He will deliver. And do not underestimate the power of small beginnings. Something that you just, you just had a thought and you just started something and you thought, oh, well, you know, just something little. It will blow your mind how it could be so huge that you can wrap your hands around it, that you will need fleets of people to help you run it. So that was an inspiring word from somebody in our generation that we can actually relate to about the power of trusting God, hallelujah. So in the verse number, um, chapter three, verse 28, after the man had gone, had gone through the fire, and the fourth man showed up in the fire. And in the words of the king, the fourth man looked like the son of a God, hallelujah. That is how the king described the angel that he saw in the furnace. It wasn't by accident that God made him see that angel in the furnace because he needed Nebuchadnezzar to know that the God that these men served was not one of his sorcerers, was not one of his soothsayers, was not one of the people that he dealt with in the land of Babylon, the magicians. This was a true God. And even through the fire, he's able to deliver. And I'm wondering if the rest of them saw the fourth man but the king definitely saw the fourth man. And so this is what he said. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in verse 28, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship 
any God except their own God. 29, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. See, the king has a temper. It's either you die, you, you get cut into pieces, you to get thrown in a furnace. He has a temper. The temperament of the king was high out there. And that is why the men decided, let's do this now. We cannot wait. Because if, if it's not today, it will be tomorrow that he will come up with something else. And he said, for their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. So apart from all his sorcerers and his magicians and all the people that he had in that land, the gods that he had, he realized very quickly that no other God can save this way. No other God can save this way. Hallelujah. And so this morning, as I bring my message to a close, I can go on and on and on about this powerful text. But I have to bring my message to a close. But I know that this morning, some of us may be going through the storm of our lives. I don't know what you are going through and you don't know what I'm going through, but some of us may be going through some sort of storm of life, but I'm here to encourage you as, as best as I can, that no matter how boisterous or how clamorous or how unrestrained the tides of your storm is, that God is telling us to focus, to focus regardless of the prayers that really haven't been answered up till now. We are still waiting. We are still waiting for that prayers to be answered. We are still waiting for a new wave of clarity of what we should do going forward. But let us focus on the staggering, the staggering immensity, the staggering immensity of the faithfulness of our God. You and I are so lucky this morning. We are privileged to have a God that is so immensely powerful before whom we can run to and he will save. The faithfulness of our God is amazing. Let's give him, let's trust him with all our hearts, with all our minds, and with all our soul. Let's trust our God that no matter what, there is no other option. There is no other option but God. So let's trust him with all our hearts. Just as he delivered the three Jewish men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, from the fire, he will deliver you and I from our fire. Nothing has come to stay. Everything that we go through is transitional. And this too shall pass. Let us trust that. Let's hold on. Hold on to that trust, regardless of what we see around us, regardless of what everybody is saying, regardless of how hot our fire is, regardless of the outcome of the elections, the outcome of this economy. We are in God's economy where he's able to turn things around even in the midst of the impossible regardless of the outcome of our job search. And I know because of COVID, a lot of our graduates are still home and they are still applying and they're still interviewing and they're still doing whatever they can to be sure 
that they secure a job. But let us not get tired and let us not be afraid regardless of the unemployment percentages that are climbing every day, regardless of, of everything that, you know, the highs and lows of the stock market. If you have a 401k or you actually have stocks in there somewhere and all the things that are going on, our finances, some have hours cut that we, you know, furloughs and everything that is going on. It's so perilous, the, the things that we have to endure. Any sickness that we come into grip with, God is still able. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. And even if he does not deliver us, we will still maintain our integrity, our trust, our hope, our faith in God. May the good Lord empower, empower us to stand up for his name as the three Jewish men did. May he empower us to stand for his name and honor him in all things that we will continue to receive divine protection, divine mercy, divine favor in everything we do, that we will fear not and we will always remember his promise that he will not leave us nor forsake us. This morning, you have an awesome God that you serve. Let's not tire. Let's not be weary. Let's not give up. No matter what we go through, no matter what we experience, our God is able to deliver. And remember that a setback is a setup for a comeback. A setback is a setup for a comeback. Hold on to that this morning and God bless you, amen.